Hello, I'm Nitin Dahad, Editor-in-Chief of EE Times, and I'm pleased to be chatting today to a former Editor-in-Chief of EE Times and veteran journalist, Richard Wallace. Hello, Richard. Hey, Nitin. How are you? Good to see you. Good. Now, I mean, you are very familiar to maybe some of our more mature audience, but maybe for the younger ones, I'm just going to go give a little bio so that then we can then sort of start the conversation. But for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Richard was at the helm of EE Times during the formative years of Silicon Valley and the electronics industry as we know it today. And that was in the sort of mid 70s. And under his leadership, he created and launched a global network of online and print technology publications for readers in China, Asia, Japan, and Europe. And that's still in operation, a lot of it. Uh, he recruited, hired, and trained the network's core of international correspondents and managed the network for 10 years in the boom time of business-to-business -business print media when we would regularly see weekly editions of EE Times going to 100 pages plus, and I remember even over 200 pages. With that background, as I take on this role, he and others before me have master, masterfully owned and executed on it. And we're going to turn the tables today for this interview. And Richard is going to interview me for a change and ask me some questions about uh, me taking on this role. Richard, over to you. Yeah, sure, Nitin. Well, that was a pretty good description. Uh, and for me, a trip down memory lane. It went. It started out as a simple newspaper that went out to 155,000 people. And then uh, I had the good pleasure of seeing it expand into this uh, global empire, as we called it. So uh, now you as editor in chief, uh, this is going to be your responsibility and you have a lot more outlets than just print. So how does it feel now to be at the, the top of the top of the heap here? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like um, there is obviously anxiety because there's a lot of expectation, but I'm really proud and honored. Uh, to be asked to take on this baton from great editors, you know, uh, yourself and you know, many others um, uh, before me. E Times has got 50 plus years history. With, and I know, you know, uh, when we did the 50 year anniversary, we did a podcast with, with you and Girish Matre, and it, you had some very good thoughts about you know, where E Times should be going. So that was kind of good grounding for me you know, to sort of understand this role. But also, I mean, I, I've been with um, Aspen Core and uh, EE Times for about seven years. So I really understand a lot of um, the, the landscape, as it were, uh, the global landscape. But I think it also it's good for me because uh, uh, as I take on this role, I'm basically for, uh, celebrating 40 years in semiconductors and electronics. I started at National Semiconductor in 1984 as an intern. And yeah, I've had lots of experiences as a as an uh, engineer, journalist, entrepreneur, marketeer, mentor, even you know, advising British government. And uh, this all I think builds on that opportunity to understand the voice uh, of many people. And you know, hopefully that can be something that I can do uh, to give a voice to the industry, which I hopefully have been doing in a little way already. And um, so. Uh, yeah, maybe a lot more. And, and one of the examples, for example, you know, started this series, The Silicon Grapevine, which is trying to talk to executives in our industry uh, about their paths, their journeys and what they learned and, and how they got to where they have, but also what excites them and what lessons they can give to others. And I think that's quite important in this day when the chip industry is really uh, yearning for youngsters to come in, have skills and on all the things I keep hearing all the time about the skills shortage. So uh, doing things that help that, but also uh, helping the editors who we employ to to, to sort of uh, get, get some great stories out there for EE Times and, and our publications. That's great, Nick. Well, uh, you certainly are qualified for this job. I've had the pleasure of working with you um, in Europe and in other places of the world for, for many, many years. And so you do have a great grasp on... Uh, the uh, the scope and the depth and the breadth of the industry, uh, but with that in mind, what what is your vision for the publication going uh, going forward? It, it, it used to be a U.S. only publication. It's now a global publication. There's uh, the waterfront's a lot bigger than it used to be. So I'm just curious what your vision is going forward. Well, I think you started it with that internationalization, and I remember you uh, starting things like um, what was it? Uh, there was E Times Europe, and then. Uh, there are a few things you, you you launched as initiatives way back, and I think um, you you kind of helped that globalization. And then 
and I would say, you know, sort of setting the scene for this whole sort of digital onslaught where it's everything is now global. So, um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, you understood it from a point of view of, you know, how that global nature of the industry operates. And uh, for, for me, we're in a very different environment where uh, we've got, and, you know, we cover it in any times and, and you've seen it in other places as well, where, you know, there, there's there's big issues around the geopolitics. And so, you know, we, we there's a geopolitics, but also at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, people say, you know, it's going to go to trillion dollar industry uh, by 2030. Uh, what does that mean? You know, it needs a lot of capacity. It needs uh, skills, as I talked earlier. Lots of other things. And hopefully my vision is to understand uh, how we can communicate some of those issues and challenges to our readers and our audience. And that's not just uh, the only thing. I think the other thing is uh, because uh, the semiconductor in industry, you know, governments are recognizing it, uh, the general public are recognizing it. When I go to, I mean, straight after the pandemic, when the um, supply chain issues became apparent, uh, I'd go to weddings and where there's nobody techie and people will say, oh, tell us about the supply chain industry in, in the semiconductor, sorry, challenges in the semiconductor industry. And I thought, wow, yeah, people are taking notice. And, and you know, when I interview people like Lars Rieger and various other people, and, and they say, you know, how our, our industry, the chip industry is getting noticed. And and what that means, and I think Girish said this on our podcast uh, two, a couple of years ago that I did with you and Girish, said, you know, we need to really ensure that we're not just hitting the bits and bytes, but higher up this, the value chain and, and so that we understand you know, the bigger issues in the industry. And uh, when we when we become more visible, there also are other issues that we need to look at. So maybe there's that. So that's on the not subject front, the topic front and you know that kind of stuff. But also you've probably seen and uh, I'm sure some of our, quite of our audience have seen, I've been doing a lot more video, audio, and you know, I'm not saying yeah, you know, uh, like the youngsters where I'm a, a TikTok um, influencer, but yeah, you know, in, in a way, I think yeah, you know, we EE Times and many others are trying to grapple with how to use video in the B two B world and how to uh, how to make sure that gets well used to communicate the message to not just our is established uh, mature audiences but the younger audiences. So I've been experimenting and there are things which are working, things which are not, and uh, I've got a very good you know publisher into in in the form of Cyrus Crone who's got a good background in in that sort of digital industry with Microsoft and various others. So I think you know we're in a good place at the moment to keep pace with new ways of audience engagement, video, podcasts, webinars, online events, and more. I mean, the AI events we've done uh, over the last year have been really good. Also, um, for example, uh, we did an event on chiplets, and yeah, that was really, really successful as well. But yeah, I, I've, as editor-in-chief, and I think I've been doing even before this, where I'm sort of on the ground reporting uh, from locations, like I've been doing a lot in India. I've you know, traveled out to Vietnam. Um, I was in Shenzhen and the uh, US, obviously, quite a lot. So I'm seeing a lot of what's going on and I'm trying to understand that through my you know, understanding of you know, different cultures and how people communicate to see how that industry can understand the global issues. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. That, that's great. A good lead into my next question. So I saw the industry change tremendously from being a US centric and slightly Europe centric becoming even more Asia-centric. And if I divide the world into those three categories, US, Europe, and Asia, which includes China, Japan, yeah. countries, just quickly, it's the geopolitical changes in the industry that are important. There's a lot of friction with the West and China now. Uh, the Europeans, uh, I think, have held their own in electronics. I'm just quick, without going into a lot of detail, mm. your general outlook for uh, these three regions. Well, I, I think um, I think I should beat a drum for the industry, and I think the general outlook is good. And I, I'll tell you why. Despite the geopolitics, I think what's happening is people in power and, and with money are taking notice. I mean, for example, just recently, you know, uh, TSMC, ESMC broke ground on, on the fab in, in Germany, and you've got you know, fabs coming up in the US, but also you've got you know, Chips Act money going into uh, developing not necessarily all leading edge but you know some of the technologies that need to be put in place for example in india i've seen you know a lot of um uh, with with renesas and micron and uh Kane semiconductor 
you know, all of them are, are are putting in facilities for technologies that are needed. You know, for example, twenty eight down to twenty eight nanometers, but also gallium nitride, silicon car silicon carbide, and yeah, you know, it's these practical approaches to ensuring bits of the supply chain are there for them. There's still, probably still going to be a lot of dependence on you know, the big big three you know, and especially TSMC for the leading edge, uh, TSMC, Intel, Samsung. But ultimately, they're building a lot more resilience. And I think that's where it's positive because money is going in. I think US leads on that with a chipset. Europe's, you know, it's, it's getting there. And and in Asia, I think, you know, for example, I saw in Vietnam when you had your, your the US president uh, who was out there uh, October, November 2023, and he, there's mon money committed to developing skills in Vietnam. And I saw went to some of the university facilities there that they're developing some of these electronics uh, manufacturing skills. So, you know, overall, although there's this geopolitics and regionalization, there's still a global global. Uh, globally dependent economy, and I think ec ecosystem and, and value chain, and I think that is what's going to keep the semiconductor industry going. That's great, Nick. So I have a question. Uh, there's always been a key driver for the industry uh, going back a ways. It was the personal computer, and then it was the mobile phone. Then you had the interplay between software and hardware. Uh, but today. We've got a super driver, and that super driver is artificial intelligence. So my question is this. Uh, how do you think the the artificial intelligence industry, if you will, uh, will drive or change the semiconductor industry in the next three to five years? Uh, that's a really good question, because I think, you know, people who are watching this understand the importance of, of you know, the computing power that's necessary to drive you know, some of the higher performance AI, but also you've got edge intelligence now happening. So putting a, a lot of intelligence locally on on a microcontroller, for example, and you know, putting what people are calling small language models on those. So I think there's a real opportunity. And I, I would say once we get over the hype of AI, we'll get some real AI applications. And those are the, the applications where the hardware and the software will drive up a lot of that need. So in a way, AI is the big driver right now, but ultimately, if you then start going granular, sensing, you know, processing, sensing, and then getting that data, analyzing it, and then doing something with it, and I think at a at a higher level, you know, that's you know gets to sort of um, intelligence, but at the lower level, it's you know just doing what's been happening already on a lot of devices. So yeah, it it, it will still continue to be the driver, but there'll be more understanding of what are the real applications. That's great. So one of the things that distinguished uh, EE e. Times in the early days was that uh, it brought together an interesting blend of not just covering the business of electronics, but also in depth, the technology of electronics. Yes. We used to talk about business, uh, you know, business technology publication. Yeah. But just, just a moment, uh, separate the two and just give me a little, tell us a little bit about what you see as important business issues and what you see as important technologies. We talked about AI, but I'm just, you know, broad stroke, big business issues, big technology issues. If you look at um, the whole sort of um, map from startups to large corporates, so, you know, the large corporates will be trying to tackle, uh, tackle the issues of the day. But then when you look at uh, the, the lack of sometimes agility of these large uh, machines, these organizations, uh, they rely on these startups. And we've seen it in the EDA industry where, you know, you get startups, they get swallowed up by, you know, Synopsys, uh, Cadence, Siemens, EDA. Uh, so it's, the, the business will continue, the business of startups, but that needs funding. And then, you know, you know they'll find applications. And then ultimately, um, the large company will, will look at figuring out how to provide that capability and acquire these companies. But at the same time, you know, uh, people would like to see independent companies uh, grow, you know, like Arm did before they got acquired. But yeah, uh, and uh, we, there are many, many companies which could potentially do that, but they ultimately fall to sort of, okay, well, we need to get acquired. So the business side is always going to be uh, continuing that way where you'll be feeding the uh, feeding the pipe with new technologies, new new um, capabilities, and maybe some of the larger companies will then start uh, sort of looking at adding those capabilities. 
And then that sort of feeds into your second part of the question, because, uh, you know, there's amazing research going on all around the world, I see. Uh, and, you know, I live in the UK, uh, but I, you know, travel all over the world and, you know, see what's happening in the in the US, in Europe, um, and even in Asia, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's real desire to create uh, innovation. And obviously, China is, is separate to that, because China's already got its programs, and they're they're feeding a lot of that. But um, I would say, um, uh, from a technology point of view, uh, there's there's a lot of research which is yearning for commercialization, looking for the right opportunities. And um, I mean, just for example, um, uh, just recently, I, I went up to visit a, a graphene facility. Yeah, you know, and um, the big challenges are very similar to you know the the challenges of 20, 30 years ago in in sort of commercializing gallium arsenide, you know, for the RF uh, front ends of the mobile phones, for example. Uh, now, you know, you've got the same challenge with graphene. How do you scale that up? So, you know, it, it's, it's a case of um, figuring out how to commercialize some of this research, kind of some of these technologies, and find an application uh, that really hits home. Uh, great. So uh, Silicon Valley was the, the key driver of not just the electronics industry, but a lot of tech industries throughout the 80s and the 90s. And one of the things that I think that we saw when we worked together was the spreading of the DNA into other countries, into other regions. Uh, and I'm just curious, one thing, first thing, what is your assessment of the role of Silicon Valley today? And uh, what do you see as the, uh, the next sort of likely two to three places that would become the epicenter, if you will, for technology innovation and technology development in the next, maybe say long term, not necessarily yeah. short. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I know, you know, and I know, you know we, this is a reason why we were, uh, we created the next Silicon Valley, the where we were looking at the, the next place that was be like Silicon Valley, but relevant to EE times. And we've been doing this Silicon 100 list um, every year, which Peter Clark uh, curates for us. And um, we, we just sort of reported uh, the, the most recent uh, report, the 2024 one. And you know, Silicon Valley has, still has significant influence. It still has a lot of the decision makers, a lot of the influence and a lot of the money. And, and, and I think that's going to dominate. But in terms of uh, your question and where do I see others, obviously, uh, for many years, we've had Israel feeding a lot of that, you know, uh, as, as, as the next Silicon Valley. And if you had to label the next Silicon Valley uh, in the model of Silicon Valley, it, for the last you know, 20, 30 years, it's probably been Israel, um, you know, Tel Aviv and, uh, and, and sort of surrounding areas. But um, there have been a lot of contenders. And uh, obviously, um, if you look at the south of France, uh, that's felt, fed a lot of RF experience and a lot of acquisitions. Uh, by large companies, obviously like Synaptics and various others, but you know that Grenoble and um, and that you know sort of South France areas verging onto where ST Microelectronics is as well. So you know you've got that that region, and then you've got the Scandinavian region. You know the the, the whole sort of uh, from uh, NXP, from Ericsson, from Nokia. Um, so I've seen a lot from there, but then you know, you know India, and again you. Know, the reason I go on about India is because I've, I've I've been there a few times over my career, and it's only now I think I'm seeing there is a a lot of desire uh, from the leaders. I mean, you know, the minister was an electronic engineer. He worked on Intel. I mean, you know, just until recently, um, as a minister uh, for electronics, and um, uh, so you know, there's a real desire to create uh, products created in India. So. Uh, I interviewed one of those, you know, Boat uh, Lifestyle, and they're the second largest uh, sorry, by volume manufacturer of um, uh, wireless earbuds in the world behind Apple. Uh, obviously not revenue, but volume. And that's saying something. Yeah, they created their own indigenous consumer devices. Uh, so there's a lot bubbling under the surface uh, for India to do a lot of that. And whether it will or not, I mean, it's got a lot of com competition from many other areas, so it it'll be interesting to see. But at the moment, I think Silicon Valley still dominates. Uh, but you've still got you've got a lot more others coming up and kind of leveling the playing field. And yeah, you know, 
I've done a, a recent interview with Peter Clark, which yeah, he describes that a lot, but also it's it's sort of described in the Silicon 100 report we did as well. Right. So uh, my experience is probably yours that uh, it, it's uh, it's not old guys like me and thinking that drive this industry. It's, it's young people. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm probably a bit far out of touch with the current generation of double E's, electronic engineers, uh, software designers, uh, innovators. But I'd just be curious. Uh, it's a whole new generation of young people. Uh, they can be very inspiring in a lot of ways, and they can be very frustrating in a lot of ways. And I'm just curious if you could give me your take on uh, the current generation of people who aspire to be movers and shakers in this industry, and uh, where you think they play. Where where do you think they'll take us? It's it's a it's very good because I. You know, one of the things I've been doing quite a lot over the last um, you know, 10, 15 years is mentoring. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just you know, background. I mean, one of the things I learned uh, when I was, was with Arc, uh, Arc International, the microprocessor company, I joined when it was just 20 engineers. Uh, well, sorry, 20 people, you know, which was engineers and a CEO. And we, we raised, I think, 140 million pounds and did a billion dollar IPO. And in that two years, uh, building that organization with with the team obviously not just me i learned a lot and and that's kind of where um since then i've hopefully been trying to impart that knowledge through my mentoring as well uh obviously it's not relevant because it's more than 20 years ago to well we ipo'd in uh september 2000 so that, that's uh, about 24 years ago but my, my point is i've worked in a lot of startups since um and one of the things is the youngsters teach you a lot and keep you relevant. And I think they have a lot of desire, a lot of ambition, and they just need old people like us to help them sort of guide them sometimes, but sometimes they can do it on their own as well. So I'm not saying uh, one way or the other, because I don't want you know, people sort of saying, ah, oh, he's totally wrong, but uh, respect all opinions. But I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of talent out there. And as I said earlier, uh, some of that uh, talent comes in the form of research. Some of that comes in the form of you know, commercial. And you know, just putting those together, you can get some really successful companies. And if that commercial comes from both young and old, I mean, even the better for it. But also, yeah, there are many people who are uh, uh, like us, um, well, not like us, like maybe uh, you know, 40, 50 somethings who still got a, a lot of life in them in terms of creating their own and creating successful uh, companies. But also the youngsters are doing that as well now. So, yeah, I think there is um, real desire. And I think, you know, uh, there's no lack of talent in that respect. So uh, it's always taken a lot of money to develop new technologies. Uh, in the early days of Silicon Valley, uh, venture capital was a very important element in driving uh, new and emerging technologies. Uh, today, the, the, the amount of capital that is available for any new business is in, in, re in retrospect astronomical. And when I look at the amount of money that has flowed into venture capital, it's stunning to me. So my question is this, the venture capital business is about managing risk. Yes. And once, so I'm, what I'd like, I'd like your outlook on how is the risk factor changing in the world of innovation given that there is now so much capital available for new ventures? Well, you know, um, I think people have learned from the, I think, from the crash of two, 2000. And, you know, the, the semiconductor industry particularly suffered quite a lot for several years, 2000 and also 2008. So there's there's a lot of, it's it's not easy VC money now, you know, for chip startups or, you know, the, the fabulous semiconductor style or even those with capital with capital requirements you know but um uh, i think uh, you need champions and i think um we, we've been working quite closely with you know com uh, organizations like silicon catalyst who work to sort of uh get companies uh incubated but also then support them with that investment journey so um I don't think I'm answering a question, but I think what well, the key is there, there's money, and you know there there are there's there's startups and there's talent. But I think one of the 
the challenges for for the both of those is just getting matched up and i think that's where uh, the the vcs are looking for deal flow uh but they need to understand uh the semiconductor industry uh you need more knowledge on the vc front but also you need uh people on on the startup ecosystem to understand how to just pitch to those investors and and i remember you know when i first went to silicon valley it was um with arc and you know, we we just pitched the wrong thing we pitched the technology you need to go higher up and this is also the important thing for e times go higher up the value chain and make you know, understand what people need and then based on that pitch so i think <laughs> i think uh, you know hopefully that kind of answers your question but doesn't no it, it's insightful and uh, it does it does give me a, a a better a better outlook well Nitin, i'm sort of out of questions here uh oh. What I, what I want to do, though, is I, I want to wish you the very best of luck in your new position. I can say with absolute certainty that both EE e. Times and the global electronics industry has been passed on to a very capable individual. And uh, it will be very interesting and exciting to see you uh, follow in the footsteps of some of the footsteps that I followed in and uh, move this industry forward in the next decade or two. Well, so I just, go on. Richard, thank you very much, because I think I, I have to say I've learned from you and or, yeah, many of the other previous editors. So hopefully I've taken all of that in, in, in a good way. And hopefully I can use bits of everything yeah, going forward. Right. OK, then. Thank you.